Welcome to the Coming Out of the Dark Bible Study with Pastor John. Tonight's study will be in the Book of Lamentations. We invite you to join us at 1 Oakley Avenue in North Providence, Rhode Island. This podcast is presented to you by The Way Ministries, supported by listeners like you. For donations, live videos, podcasts, and more, please visit www.thewayministriesri.org. Thank you and have a great day. Welcome to the Coming Out of the Dark Bible Study. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight to get a portion of God's Word. Amen. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our Lord and Savior, as always. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into our lives and saving us from ourselves, Lord. Doing for us we could never, ever do for ourselves, Lord. All glory and honor goes to you. I'd like to thank the core of the ministry, one body, many parts. If you got a cell phone, can you please silence it so it doesn't disturb tonight's study? And we'll start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, our mighty, powerful Savior, thank you for giving us this beautiful day today, Lord, and this beautiful opportunity to gather together today, Lord, to worship you, to honor you, and to glorify you, Lord, and to bring your name above all names, even our own, Lord, as all of us fight to put you first in our lives, Lord. Let the word penetrate our hearts tonight, Lord. Let it reach the people it needs to reach beyond the four walls through the live feed and bring salvation through your word to someone in need tonight, Father. I pray for our great nation, Lord, that you keep your hands upon it, Lord. I pray for the Bible to be restored back into this country and into the White House, into all the states, Lord. So I bring, pray for unity in the body. I pray for the people that are sick, our sister Susan, brother George. Uh, Alana and anyone else who might not be feeling well in our church, Lord, that you reassure them you're with them, Lord, and your healing hands are upon them, Lord. Either way, it's a win-win for all of us, Lord. Thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us, Lord. I pray that we all become humble and teachable tonight like clay in your hands, Lord, so you can mold us and shape us into the image of your Son so we can glorify you, Lord, and bring others into your kingdom. And as always, let this all be led by your spirit tonight, Father, and not my flesh. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. All right, let's stand and worship the Lord.
What a great song that is, huh? Ain't nothing better than Jesus. All right, no place I'd rather be. Glad to see everybody tonight. Come out to get a portion of God's word, especially on a Wednesday, right halfway point. I'll definitely need it tonight, that's for sure. Sometimes things don't work out the way we think they're gonna, and we just gotta hang in there and trust the Lord. You know, he's gonna bring us through every season, every trial, he's always there, and it's always just for a season, so we just gotta be patient. One thing, we're not very patient people in this. We always want what we want when we want it. We want God to get us an answer of our prayers right away, right away, but he's, he, we have to be patient, because he's, the things that he does for us stick, and they take a while to produce. And anything that lasts, any kind of quality takes time. Anything that's really hasty usually isn't from God. He takes his time. Read the Bible. He takes his time to build his kingdom and his people. Permanent change. All right. I just pray that this message, the Holy Spirit, will be taken over. And then it goes beyond the four walls and brings salvation to someone watching maybe way across the world tonight. That the word will touch someone's heart. I also pray that the people out there that are watching that consider this this church will be cheerful givers and support the ministry so we can keep this message going as the expenses go up so we can get this message even farther out there. One body, many parts. All right, let's start in 1 Peter tonight, chapter 1, as we're going to continue our study in Lamentations. And we are in chapter 3 tonight. If you haven't been with us for this study, you can always go back on the website and, and, and study it from... Um, chapter 1, as these messages are always there and available, even to go back and, you know, reiterate or if you miss something, because, you know, we get distracted really easy. You know, Lamentations is a great book. It's definitely an eye-opener for me. I hope it's an eye-opener for you as we get into this book. All right. She got us in verse 3. Go right to 1. God's great blessings to his people. Greetings from Peter. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the province, provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and Greystone. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. And his spirit has made you holy. See, we can't make ourselves holy. His spirit is what makes us holy. How about a big amen there? As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. Oh, do we need a lot of that? <laughs> the hope of eternal life. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, oh, hold on a second. The devil's always trying to distract us, see? Eh? Right through the middle of a sentence. That's all right. Get refocused there. All right, verse 5. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So God, he's protecting us right now. We're sort of in protective custody from God while we're waiting to go home to be with him. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Do you see what it says there? even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. So we're saying here, yeah, when we go through the trials, and you hang in there and keep trusting God and keep praying, keep coming to church and reading your Bible, it's telling us that your faith is real. How about a big amen there? It's a test. 
It says right here, it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. And through your faith, though your faith is more, far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So when Jesus comes back, we hang in knees and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We're ready to go home to be with him because we trusted in him and we hung in there and we put our heads up high because we've been living for him till he comes back. Look what it says in verse 8. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him, now you trust him and you rejoice with the glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. How about a big amen? By trusting in him and obeying him will be, the reward will be salvation of our souls. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. The salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. All the messages from the prophets were for us. Imagine. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. How about a big amen there? All right, we'll stop there. The angels are just watching right now, waiting for that day to come when Jesus comes back and rescues us from here, when the rapture comes. Just imagine what that day is going to be like. People might not understand the rapture, but, but we're going to be like taken out of here. We're not going to die. We're just going to be taken out of here in a moment. Just like that. We're out. See ya. And then God's going to um, throw judgment down on this earth. And that's why you want your kids and your family to be saved. Because if they're not, they're staying down here to suffer the torture and the judgment of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not going to be a pretty day down here when he comes back. He's not coming back with water. He's coming back with fire. So it's going to be really bad down here. So what we want to do is get everybody saved that we can, right? Bring everybody we can back with us. That's our job since we go until we go home to be with him. To tell them about Jesus before it's too late, you never know. There was a couple of tragedies that just happened, right? The girl was riding her bike. All of a sudden, she fell off the bike. The truck ran over and killed her, 25 years old. You never know when something could happen. Today is the day of salvation. You never know. You're not promised another day down here. And everybody says, well, I'm just going to wait to talk about it. Look, today is the day of salvation. Tell people about Jesus today and every day. Tell your kids. Tell your family. Tell the people you work with about Jesus that he's coming back. If they don't repent and turn to him, hell's going to be their home. And that's not a good place to be. If you read what hell's all about, torment forever, burning in hell. It's like, just imagine catching fire and not dying, living through that forever, just burning, torment. That, that alone scares me enough to want to go to Jesus. You know what I'm saying? That's torture. Oh, my goodness. Two things most people fear, drowning and burning, right? Just imagine drowning. But there's nothing more painful than fire because you don't die right away. You suffer. Oh, and then you don't die, you keep suffering. We don't want any of our family or eight people to go to hell. So there's only one way to get them out of there, is get them to believe in Jesus, or else they're going. It's scary. All right, let's study. Let's go into Lamentations chapter 3. I'm going to summarize this a little bit tonight <clears throat> before we get into the book. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite chapters of this book, chapter 3 here. It talks about trials and tribulations. <clears throat> All right, so 
Jeremiah, the poet, has seen all this awful stuff with his own eyes that we've been studying. He's personally experienced it too, okay? We sense he's speaking on behalf of all Judah. Trust us, the poet knows what God's wrath is, okay? God has abandoned him in times of trouble and left him to find his own way out of the dock, okay? Next time, bring a flashlight. God has also filled the poet's heart with bitterness and then trapped him there like a prisoner. Just imagine what he's putting Jeremiah through right now, okay? The poet cried out for God to help him, but the big guy wouldn't listen. Listen now. God ignored his prayer requests and returned all this fan mail too, stone cold. God was not hearing it. One thing about God, when judgment falls, there's no like relenting it. It falls and it falls, there's no turning back. So we have to understand how God works here. God was like a lion pacing outside the poet's pr prison cell. He was just waiting to tear the poet to pieces as soon as he struck his head out, stuck his head out. Or maybe he was like an archer, just itching to use the poet as target practice. The poor poet, poor Jerusalem. But keeping the faith. But even in all this misery and horribleness, the poet doesn't lose heart. Really? Okay, yup. He just remembers one really important thing. And I want you to remember one really important thing. God can't stay mad at us forever. Okay? There's always a season when he's mad, and then when, it, when it's over, it's over. So he can't stay mad at us forever. That's right. God is loving. God is merciful. So at some point, he's going to have to come around and start helping the poet again. All right? Right? He, every morning the poet wakes up, is a chance for him to renew his relationship with God. If he has patience, God will be good to him in the end. And in the meantime, God asked him to go through a couple of trials, like watching his city be destroyed, his friends and family murdered, and his children starved to death. Then he'll deal with it. Sure, listen now. God causes all kinds of trouble for people, but he is also compassionate. In any case, it's not like God enjoys making all this bad stuff happen. Listen to me now. His heart is not just not in that. When there's evil stuff happening in the world, God sees it and takes copious notes for later. Remember that now. But one thing, well, no one can do anything, good or bad, unless God says it's okay. Remember one thing. Nothing can happen in your life or anyone's life without God's permission. He's in charge. Everything comes from God even starving babies. Really, all God's doing is, is doling is out justice. You can't complain when God has just given you what you deserve, right? That's why the people of Judah need to take a good look at themselves and return to God. They were sinful and disobedient, so he got angry and destroyed them. He ignored their prayers, left them for dead, and watched as their enemies crushed them. No, this is not just an overreaction here. You've seen what he did, but God gave him plenty of time to repent in turn, and he always gives us a chance to what? Repent in turn before judgment falls. Can I get an amen here? Now, all the poet wants is for God to right the wrongs that have been done to him. God saw all the horrible things these enemies have done, now all he has to do is smite the heck out of them. It's payback time. God, get angry, curse them, destroy the poet's enemies because they've done so many awful things. Come on, you know you want to. They never were your special people. So God used them to judge the people, but then after that, he judged them. Just remember one thing. God's going to judge your enemies. Don't you try to judge them. The moment you try to judge them is when he's not going to judge them, and the judgment's going to fall on your head. You're not God, so don't take matters in your own hand as a Christian. Trust me, there's an awful price to pay for that when you take matters in your own hand. Can I get an amen here? All right, let's go now. Lamentations chapter 3, look at verse 1. Hope in the Lord's faithfulness. The prophet Jeremiah is speaking here. Actually, this is almost like a song. I am the one 
who has seen the afflictions that come from the rod of the Lord's anger. He has led me into darkness, shutting out all light. He has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and flesh grow old. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and surrounded me with anguish and distress. He has buried me in a dark place like those long dead. Think of that deep depression that God put him in. Think about this. Have any of you experienced deep depression while you're down here? Well, let me tell you something. That comes from God's hand. And you know what causes depression? Our sins. Cause depression in our bad choices in our life or what causes depression. Can I get an amen here? He has buried me in a dark place like those long dead. He has walled me in and I cannot escape. He has bound me in heavy chains and though I cry and shout, he has shut out my prayers. Just think about what he's going through right here. The nation's getting destroyed. God is not, he's not hearing from God at all. Now a prophet hears from God. He wasn't hearing from God at all. He was crying and lamenting. He didn't know what was going on. God was not speaking to him. God was not talking to him. God was angry with the whole nation. That's why God doesn't play favorites. And that's why your sins don't just affect you. Jeremiah wasn't doing anything wrong, but he still suffered for the nation's sins. Can I get an amen here? There's people that are innocent not doing anything wrong that suffer from our sins. Can I get a big amen here? When you think about that, you say, you know what? I better stop sinning because I don't want anybody else to get hurt by them. When your heart changes, you don't want to sin and let other people pay the price for it. Because more than one person pays the price for your sins. Like I said before, the church suffers when you sin. The people next to you suffer when you sin. The nation suffers when you sin. Everything suffers because of your sins. Not just you. Now look at verse 9. He has blocked my way with the high stone wall. He has made my road crooked. He has hidden like a bear or a lion waiting to attack me. He has dragged me off the path and torn me in pieces, leaving me helpless and devastated. Has anybody ever felt this as a Christian? I've been in these desert places with my Christian life. I've been here. I don't know about you, but I've been here, and that's what? I never got off the road. I stayed on the road because I knew these scriptures, because Jeremiah stayed on the road, and he got out of it. And that's what kept me from getting out off the road. I said, you just hang in there, John. God's going to get you through this. It's only a test. And whenever the test, it has to end soon. Whenever it is, it might take a year, two, whatever it is, it will end. It's a guarantee. Because it, why do I, Because I read this chapter, and it told me that it did. Now look what it says. He has drawn his bow. He has made me a target for his arrows. Verse 13. He shot his arrows deep into my heart. My own people laugh at me. All day long they sing their mocking songs. All the prophets got mocked for representing God properly. He has filled me with bitterness and given me a bitter cup of sorrow to drink. He has made me chew on gravel, and he has rolled me in the dust. Peace has been stripped away, and I have forgotten what prosperity is. I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond Words or his wormwood and gall. Now think about this now. He was homeless and suffering, and he was serving God wholeheartedly. Do you see how there's no guarantee? You could still come to church, read your Bible, serve God wholeheartedly, and still go through the trials of life. It doesn't play favorites with us. Can I get an amen here? You have to understand, just because you come to church, that does not exempt you from the troubles of the world. As a matter of fact, you can't get endurance and grow without them. You can't become a child of God unless you go through these trials and tests. But people aren't taught that, and what do they do? Oh, how can God do that to me? I'm such a good person. But we have to understand, 
In whose eyes are we good persons? In God's eyes, we're all sinful and wicked. There's a motive behind everything we do. We think we, we judge ourselves to a standard that God doesn't judge us. He judges the standard saying, listen, if you want to judge yourself, you're going to be just like Jesus. Perfect. Your own righteousness it won't save you. How about a big amen here? So what do people do? They get mad at God when he punishes them for their sins. We get mad at God. Why God? Why God? Why are you doing this to me? He does, he punishes us or he chastens us because of our sinfulness, number one, and to change us and to make us grow into his image. So you have to evaluate yourself constantly and saying, am I getting judged and chastened because I've been living wrong? Or am I getting judged and chastened because he wants to take me to the next level? But that's up to you to see. You have to evaluate that and evaluate your life to see why it's happening. Because it's guaranteed it's not if it's going to happen, it's when. God's not some genie in the sky that people make him out to be, or churches make him out to be. That's not the God of the Bible. He loves us enough to want to change us to be like Jesus. And whatever he has to do to do that, he is going to do. And it's a personal thing that he does with all of us. Now look what it says. Look at verse 20. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. So he said he'd never, it was so bad. His prop, it was so bad that he said he'd never forget it. One thing we do is forget how bad it was at one time. And then we end up going back into Egypt again. Remember it, forgetting that it was bad. And then what? Getting chastened again. Now look what he says here. Look at verse 21. Yet I still did a hope. When I remember this, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. Or in the Hebrew reads, of the Lord keeps us from destruction. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. How about a big amen there? Do you see? Do you see what he said? No matter what he went through, he remembered the faithfulness of God and his mercies begin afresh each morning. You have to remember that whatever you're going through. Now listen, before we go on, I want to reiterate on this verse. In verse 23, Jeremiah knew from personal experience about God's faithfulness. God had promised that punishment would follow disobedience, and it did. But God had also promised future restoration and blessing, and Jeremiah knew that God would keep that promise also. Remember, he promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us. Because God is faithful day by day, we can be confident that he will come through in his great promises for the future. Can I get an amen here? It's only for a season. I don't care what anybody's going through right now. It can't happen unless God allows it. And you have to understand why he's allowing it. And he said he always makes a, risk, uh, a way out. What's the way out? Confession and repentance. Is the way out of it. When you get humble before the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know what it is. Whatever it is that I did, I know I must be guilty of something. And if not, I must be doing something right that you're going to change me into the image of Jesus. Either way, he's the one that's doing it. You can't blame the devil because the devil has to get permission to touch us. You see, once you understand how God works, you won't get weary in this work. It's just another season. Remember, after the blessing, listen, we get blessed a lot. You got up this morning, didn't you? You got food in your stomach, didn't you? None of you look starving, right? Comfortable, air-conditioned, not. There's people right now that are struggling and suffering to get a piece of bread. They're drinking water that's gray. They can't take a shower. America is so spoiled right now that our blessing is becoming a stumbling block because nobody thinks they need Jesus because everything's provided in this country. But guess who's providing all this? God is providing it and people want to take God out of our country. 
People really don't understand that God is the provider of all this stuff. He provides the clean air that we breathe, the fresh water that we drink, right? The shelter over our heads. He provides all of that for us. If anything, do we have not one bit of complaint to complain about anything? Because everything else is, is our own fault that we did. Can I get an amen here? Thank God that it didn't it isn't worse for you. Because it could be a lot worse. Somebody didn't get up today. Somebody can't get to church. Somebody lives in a country that there's no church around. They don't even have a Bible. They don't even know who Jesus is. There's no hope. Every day you wake up, you have hope. It says his tender great mercies begin afresh each morning. His faithfulness, his mercies begin afresh each morning. Why do we forget so easy what God provides for us every day? As soon as something happened tonight, right? When you first time coming to church, the devil got in to try to throw a monkey wrench and cause a problem out there, right? Do you think that was by accident? That wasn't by accident. That's all orchestrated. You see it? But what'd you do? You hung in there, you came in, and now you're still sitting here. So you passed the test. Some people would just turn around and go home. Or I'll fight back. Well, I mean, God put me there for a reason, so you couldn't. See? Even that was in a coincidence. Because maybe you were starting to get fired up over it. See, this is what happens. We're here, listen, we're here to help each other. One thing about churches, people tear each other down instead of helping each other. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're supposed to love each other, not talk about each other and complain about each other. It's sickening what goes on in churches. Remember, Jesus is in all of us. All of us are the body of Christ. He never leaves any of us. We leave him. He doesn't leave us. This church building right here has been sitting here since 1905. If you're not sitting inside here, it's because you chose not to. Not because the church isn't here for you. The church is always here for you. That's why we keep it open. What stops you from coming through the door? You ask yourself that question. Is it the devil? Is it anything else? Because, listen, nothing's stopping me from getting up here. If, I, if you really want something, you'll be here. If I told everybody there's 10 grand sitting in the pew for you if you show up for church tonight, people would be outside running in here, busting the door down to get in here. Now, wouldn't they? To get the 10 Gs. So then who's, God, who's really their God? Then we'll see how many excuses people make. Oh, I couldn't make it to church tonight. I couldn't do this. I didn't do this. And I wasn't here. Oh, they'd make, they'd get here. Can I get any men here? So that's what I compare it to. If you really wanted to be in church, you'd be in church. So it's just a choice. Does God still love you? Absolutely. But there's just consequences when we desert God. He doesn't walk away from us. There's always a price to pay. Thank God he doesn't leave us or forsake him because we leave him and forsake him. As soon as things don't go our way, right, in our program on Monday, get angry when things don't go our way. So we get angry at God when things don't go our way down here. All right, look at verse 24. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. Now, when you're going through something, he's telling you how to respond to it. The, I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I hope in him. Whatever you're going through, go for lamentations and read chapter 3 and say, okay, I'm going through the same stuff he is. I'm going to handle it the way he did. Here's the solution. I'm not going to gripe and complain. Did you hear him gripe and complain? He didn't gripe and complain. What do we do? <laughs> I can't believe it. I mean, we got all these problems. It 
It's time to start showing some fruit. You'll know my people by their fruit. Let me tell you something. When you've got the Lord and your spirit is filled with him, you are joyful no matter what's going on. You're not complaining. You're not griping. Because the human heart is griping and complaining. God's heart is rejoicing. Always. You have a choice each and every day to gripe and complain or rejoice. No matter what's going on. Did Jesus complain? Look what they were doing to him. Did Jesus do anything wrong? Why'd they kill him then? Listen, they're going to want to kill you down here for doing the right thing. What's wrong is right and what's right is wrong in the world. Can't you see that by now? Or is your head in the sand? God asks us to live out of this world. Don't live by the ways of the world. And then you won't get the chastening of the ways of the world. You see, he's trying to protect us from ourselves. Now look at verse 25. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So now, the question is, when you're going through the trial, when you're aggravated, when you're angry, are you depending on him? Or are you saying, I can't take this, I'm taking matters in my own hand, and I'm going to, I'm going to provide the solution. I'm going to open my mouth instead of keeping it shut. And who pays the price? Not God. Not God. Guess who pays the price? We do. When God says, no, leave it in my hands. Keep your mouth shut so I can handle it. You open your mouth, you want to be God? God says, there's nothing I can do for you. Now look what it says. Look at verse 26. So it is good to wait <laughs> quietly for salvation from the Lord. Now salvation it means deliverance. Okay, so whatever you might be going through. Now he's not talking about salvation from the penalty and power of sin. He's talking about deliverance from whatever trial you're going through. It's a whole different thing here. He's saying it's good to wait quietly for deliverance from the Lord. It's good to wait quietly for the Lord to rescue you from these trials. Do you? Do you wait quietly or do you try to kick and squirm your way out of it? Or do you take matters in your own hands? That's why, that's why God says, you know, I got a bunch of babies. I'm telling them what to do to trust me, to trust and obey, and you're still taking matters in your own hands, and then you're asking God, where are you? How can God be where you are when you're God? See, you're being God in the situation instead of saying, I'm going to turn it over to him. So when you play God, he's saying, well, you're, I'll have no other gods before me. So you want to be God, so you handle it. And what does he do? He backs off. And what do we do? We end up making a mess, getting on our knees again, come crying out, Lord, help me. That's what the nation did. How many times did they come crawling back to God? Now look what it says, verse 27. And it is good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of his discipline. Why? The younger you are to submit to God, the better off you're going to be down here. You get it? God's the boss. See, when you put God as the boss, you're going to have a good life down here. But when you don't put God as the boss and you decide to be the boss, you're going to have problems. Now look what it says in verse 28. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. Let them turn the other cheek to those who strike them and accept the insults of their enemies. Now let me ask you this. Do you accept unfair treatment when you're here? Or do you have to put your mouth and open your mouth and try to make a difference? And you have to say something about it to defend yourself. Well, that means that Jesus is not your advocate. You are. Instead of saying, God allowed that person to talk to me that way. So I'm going to keep my mouth shut and I'm going to go pray to Jesus. And he's going to get me out of it. Because if I open my mouth... He's not going to help me. And then I'm going to suffer the consequence of it. Let me just give you a lot of fair warning. Whoever God puts over you, over you, God wants you to treat them like you would treat Jesus Christ. 
I don't care if they're harsh, punishing, or cruel. You have to treat them like Jesus Christ as one of God's children. And if you do that, God said he'll bless you. Now, how many people do that? The unbelieving world oh, only love those who love you. What about your enemies, though? How about people who are persecuting you? Jesus didn't open his mouth. He left it in his father's hands. Do you want God, the guy who created all this, to help you? Well, then you can't. You're going to keep your mouth shut. As soon as you open it, then he can't help you anymore. How many times, honestly, do we take matters in our own hands and defend ourselves? I thought Jesus was your advocate. How can you say that Jesus is your advocate when you're defending yourself? You're a liar. You're actually lying to yourself, saying that I'm taking matters in my own hand, but Jesus is my advocate. No, he's not. You're your advocate. See? You're, you're playing Jesus. So what does Jesus do? He says, he lets you do it and make a mess. And then what do you do? You come back, oh, I can't believe I did that. I opened my big fat mouth again and got in trouble. I'm just as guilty as you are. I'm not afraid to admit that I take matters in my own hands sometimes and make and pay the price. Thank God has mercy on us. I mostly say, I'm kicking you out. You're no good. You worship somebody, you, you took matters in your own hand, you can't come back to me anymore. Thank God he doesn't do that. How many times do we take matters in our own hands and God still, he loves us still. He doesn't abandon us. How about a big amen there? That's why it's so important to read the Bible. So you can understand the Christian that you say you are and the God you say that you love, you can understand how he works. Now, how many people actually get taught that? How many people get to know, actually know who God is, that the, who they worship, or his ways, how his ways are, when nobody's taught that? Now listen. In verse 30, this call to turn the other cheek reminds us that sometimes God calls us to suffer for his purposes. Okay? Jesus taught his followers to turn the other cheek in Matthew 5.39. Okay? And he exemplified this at the highest level just before his crucifixion in Matthew 27. 27 to 31 and Luke 22 to 64. This teaching, however, should never be used to justify physical, verbal, or emotional abuse. See, we have to know the lines here. Nor is it a requirement that anyone should submit to, abu to abuse of treatment. Now, we have to understand, we can't let somebody just beat us and say, okay, okay, Lord, it's, I'm just going to let that happen. See, there's a fine line here. We have to understand what he's talking about here. Can I get an amen here? Like if your, boss, if your boss at work had had a bad day and he just says, you know, he insults you with something, you know, I'm leaving. I'm leaving my job because he had a bad day. That's the stuff we have to take the hit on. We don't take the hit on if he comes and smacks you in the face. I'm not going to let him smack me in the face. I'm not somebody going to come in my house and stab my wife. I'm not going to say, oh, is your wife home? Yeah, I want to kill her. Oh, come right in. Jesus got you. <laughs> No, I'm going to pop a hole in them. Nobody's going to get, not going to get out of my house. If you come in and try to harm my family, I'm going to defend it. Anybody comes in here and try to hurt this church, I'm going to defend it. Me in Springfield. And I'm good at it too, so I practice the target from here to there. So if anybody comes in here and, and any kind of thing, I'm popping them. They ain't going to make it out. They ain't, nobody's going to get hurt in this church, trust me. I'm locked and loaded at all times behind here. I can see the door from here. I'm watching it all the time. And there's AR-500 steel right under this pulpit. Said so bullet ain't getting through it. The Bible says to be wise, especially in these evil days. Churches are soft targets. You know that, right? People come right in and shoot them up like nothing. No, we're in evil, we're in evil days right now. We're in evil days, and it's up to us to protect, <laughs> to protect each other. 
Don't you worry. I'm protecting you. Not only am I up here to teach you, I'm here to protect you too. I'm a shepherd, right? I'm the what? I protect the flock. The pastor protects the flock. He puts his life down for the flock. If anybody's going to take the bullet, it's going to be me. Not you. Can I get any men here? Oh, yeah. Don't worry. I, I have no, no problem squeezing the trigger if somebody's going to try to hurt somebody in here. Don't worry. You are protected. All right. Verse 31. Now listen what it says. For no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Do you see it? Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion. Who brings the grief? The Lord brings the grief. It says, though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the grateful greatness of his un failing love for he does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow how about a big amen there now let me just reiterate on this a minute from verses 27 to 33 to submit to the yoke of his discipline means to willingly yield to God's discipline and learn what he wants to teach you this involves several important factors now listen to me one Silent reflection on what God wants. Two, repentant humility. Three, self-control in the face of adversity. Okay? And four, confident patience depending on the divine teacher to bring about loving lessons in our lives. God has several long-term and short-term lessons for you right now are you doing your homework? That's the question. Are you? There's lessons going on in everyone's life right now. Some of us might be in a good season of blessing. Some of us might be in a season of what? Trials and testings? And adversity? The teacher, who do you think is bringing that into your life? God is. And it's up to you to respond the way I just told you. With confident patience depending on the divine teacher to bring about loving lessons in our lives. The question is, you have to understand, what's the lesson in all this? What is God trying to teach me through this problem? What is he trying to teach me through this blessing? What is he trying to show me in this situation? That's where the meditation comes in. Where we have to think on what God is doing and why he's doing it. So we don't take matters in our own hands. See, this has to be circulating. What I'm teaching you has to be circulating out there. See, because that's when it happens. See, are you remembering the principles that you're getting taught in church? So you can what? Become the overcomer that he wants you to be. Or are you not remembering them? Are they going in and one ear and out the other? And you're just being like some stubborn, stubborn mule. That needs a bit in its mouth to stay under control, the Bible says. What does that mean? Instead of learning from the word of God, listening to it, and obeying it, we have to go through suffering and pain to obey. Either way, he's going to have his way. Have you not noticed? Believe me, once you're in, you can't get out. That's the thing. See, you can be disobedient all you want. If you're his, you're his, and he's going to punish, he's going to chase, he's going to chase in you. That's for any good father. So wouldn't it be wise to say, you know what? <laughs> just, haven't I learned yet to just be obedient? I'm just teaching on obedience. Do you realize how much of a blessing to be an obedient is? And how many, how many awesome things can happen to you if you just obey what God tells you to do and stop making problems for yourself? And taking matters in your own hands. Because nothing, I mean absolutely nothing, can happen in your life as a believer in Jesus Christ that hasn't been through God's hand. Not one thing. So if you see it that way, you'll understand, okay, God, what are you trying to show me? What am I doing? Check yourself before you. Now look at verse 34. If people crush underfoot 
all the prisoners of the land? If they deprive others of their rights in defiance of the Most High, if they twist justice in the courts, doesn't the Lord see all these things? Everybody thinks, where's God? Where's God? God sees everything. You see, you understand, he's not like he doesn't see it. He sees it. Listen, look at verse 37. Who could command things to happen without the Lord's permission? You see it? Nothing can happen without his permission. Does not the most, now look at verse 38. Listen to me now. Doesn't the most high send both calamity and good? Everybody thinks that God is a genie and all he does is send good. He's the one who sends calamity too. Why does he send calamity? What happens when something happens, when a major disaster happens out there, right? What does it do? It brings people together. People that might not have helped each other, hated each other as neighbors their whole life, will go and help each other when the disaster strikes. Why does it have to take that for us to be together and love each other? Right? Like those people across the street, they wouldn't even think of doing anything for us, right? If something happens over there, we'd be right there to try to help them. Even though they don't care. They could care if the place burns down. It doesn't matter. You see, when problems come, people come together. So God has to make problems to bring people together. What do you think he brought COVID here for? He tried to bring COVID here to bring back a revival in the church. To stop what's going on in the world and bring everybody back to God. What happened? The opposite. They closed the churches and left the liquor stores open as a necessity can you believe can you believe that the liquor store became an essential and the church wasn't an essential that's how twisted our country is when the problems come they couldn't shut the liquor stores down because half the, na half the nation is drunk it's the truth they have to get their liquor they can't live without it. But what is that? That becomes their God. So God was trying to show us, no, I'm your God. Come back to me. He shut down the football fields, the hockey rinks. He shut down all the sports that everybody worships. To bring them back in line with God, and, what it, and God knew what their hearts were going to be. One thing, our church never closed. We never closed. And they were trying to make us close. Remember? That's how you know where this world is heading. Do you think that could have happened without God's permission? He's the one who sends the pestilence. He's the one who sends the diseases. Now listen. Look at verse 39. Then why should we mere humans complain... <clears throat> when we are punished for our sins. Yet we do. Instead, let us test and examine our ways and let us turn back to the Lord. What does it cause? The problems are designed. Listen to what it's saying. Instead, let us test and examine our ways and let us get back to the Lord again. Let us lift our hearts and hands to God and heaven and say, we have sinned and rebelled, and you have not forgiven us. How about a big amen there? All right, we're going to have to stop there. We're out of time. <clears throat> so when we get back together, we're going to go into verse 43. So now we're getting an understanding how God works, right? All right. Dave, you want to come up and close us? Then we're going to watch a video. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. We're so grateful and thankful for these messages that you give to the pastor, Lord, and for a pastor who not only preaches the truth of your word exactly the way you intended, Lord, but also the tough, convicted messages, Lord, the messages that we need if we are truly to grow in our walk with you, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that we're able to use those messages and convictions, Lord, not to become bitter, Lord, but 
to make the changes needed in order to live that life that you called us to live, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be distracted by anything that might take us away from you and your word, Lord, but always remain thankful, Lord, that you've given us another day, Lord, to serve you, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that our faithfulness would overflow to those around us, Lord, and that they might be inspired, Lord, to turn to you before it's too late. And I just pray, Lord, that you continue to watch over this church, Lord. Watch over our families, Lord, and I pray for those who are sick, Lord, that you might have your healing hands upon them, Lord, and comfort them, reassure them, you never leave them nor forsake them, and that you're going to be with them always. And I just pray this in your holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, Thanks Dave. All right. We're going to watch your video and close.